The Lawyer Who Rocks is brought to you by Hughes Media Law Group. You can visit us at hmlglaw.com. Keep up with the podcast on social media at HMLG Law on all major platforms and be sure to follow us there. Thank you for listening and enjoy this episode of The Lawyer Who Rocks. My name is Jolene Winther Hughes. I am a lawyer who rocks. Today's guest is an associate professor of astronomy at UW, an MIT alumni, the recipient of the 2020 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize, and the 2014 Annie Jump Cannon Award winner from the American Astronomical Society, as well as the author of the incredibly popular science book, The Last Stargazers, which of course is on my bookshelf. To say that this woman is smart and accomplished is an understatement. I'm so excited to talk with my client, Emily Levesque. Welcome today, Emily. Hi, thanks for having me here. So we all love your book so much here. It's been passed around the office, but for listeners who haven't read it, let's talk about some of the things that you talk about in your book, The Last Stargazers. Yeah, so The Last Stargazers is a book that takes readers on sort of a behind the scenes tour of what it's like to be a professional astronomer. And the whole idea of it is it's not hard to sell people on space being awesome. Everybody loves looking at, you know, the gorgeous pictures that you get from the Hubble Space Telescope of like galaxies or nebulae or hearing about us landing rovers on Mars or like maybe discovering signs of life elsewhere in the universe. But we tend to see this news as kind of headlines. And something that not a lot of people know about is the backstory and the, you know, tales of how we actually do this research. Astronomers as a job are actually really rare. There's about 50,000 professional astronomers in the world. So it's not that weird that people don't know our stories and what our kind of weird jobs are like. And I wrote the book to kind of pull back the curtain on that and explain to people not just the cool science and how our field's changing, but what it's actually like, you know, work at remote telescopes in the middle of nowhere or study things that are on the other side of the universe for your job every day. Why are there so few astronomers? I don't know, because it's, you know, 50,000 people studying the rest of the universe. But I know that obviously the more support we can get for sort of scientific research and funding, the better. There's certainly no shortage of enthusiasts for astronomy, but it's a small field. It's a very competitive job. And I think it just winds up working out that right now it's a very small field. I think all of us would love to see our field double, triple in size because there's no shortage of stuff to be done. So what for you, and it's amazing that you're so accomplished in this area, what started your interest in astronomy? We tend to think of astronomy as just, oh, look at the stars. And stargazing is wonderful and an incredibly enjoyable part of the job. But there's a lot of, you know, physics and chemistry and math buried in it. And I think when people know that, it sort of lets you go into a class like that a little forewarned. For me, though, and I think for a lot of people, the stargazing is what kicked off my interest. So I was a really little kid when I got into astronomy. I was about two, and that was the last time that Halley's Comet made sort of a close pass by Earth. It's this comet that comes by, I think, every 86 years or so. And my big brother had to study the comet for a school project. So my whole family went out into the backyard. I was little, I was tired, I was kind of fussy and scared of the dark until my parents pointed me up. And apparently from that point, I was spellbound. And from then on, people would ask me what I was going to be when I grew up. And I'd answer, well, I'm going to be a ballerina or an astronomer, or I'm going to be a firefighter or an astronomer. And astronomer just kept sticking. So I went to college. I started studying physics because I knew that that was what you needed to become an astronomer. And it went from there. So I know that it's one of my missions to try and inspire more women to get involved in science, right? Did you find that you were one of few women involved in the studies? So the field has actually evolved a lot over time. And I think by the time I was coming up as a student, I was very lucky to have a lot of supportive professors, to have 
peers of all genders that I got to sort of share the journey with, that has not always been the case. And it's still not the case for everybody, which is really too bad. But equality in astronomy is getting better. I believe, I'm not sure I'll remember the exact numbers, but when they last did sort of a survey of the demographics that were granted PhDs in astronomy, women earned about 40% of the astronomy PhDs. That was in 2017. So that's really not too bad. Of course, this is very different if you look at Hispanic astronomers or black astronomers. And that's an area in which the field still has a long way to go. But I write in the book about the women who didn't have the experience that I had, who were sort of the first women to observe and run operations at telescopes and sort of how they had to fight for that ability. Women weren't allowed to be in charge at telescopes for decades and decades and women made it happen anyway, but it just put an extra barrier in their place. So it's been really amazing to see that change. And I hope the field sort of continues on that track of letting anybody participate who's interested in astronomy. And how did that set you up for a career? Because I know that there are certain colleges and certain programs and colleges that really the collegiality of it all, pardon the pun, I guess, really you know, it it actually creates a network and kind of almost your first networks into your career. Yeah, I mean, that was a massive advantage of getting to go to MIT. The collegiality of just myself and the other students was wonderful because you're battling through some of the hardest college classes in the world and it could very easily be demoralizing except everyone around you is struggling in the same way. So it taught me the satisfaction of just working really hard and staying up all night for work very early on. And MIT Physics is also an amazing program. I got to learn how to observe and use a telescope from one of the great observational astronomers, Jim Elliott. Through them, I got the chance to attend some summer programs. I met collaborators that I'm still working with today. MIT really supports research for students, so I got involved in research very early on, and it gave me an early taste of what my job would be like. So it was a wonderful way to sort of jumpstart that career. Well, what brought you out West eventually? I work. So this is a side effect of astronomy being small and of working in academia, that you very much sort of follow where the jobs and opportunities are and in astronomy's case, where the telescopes are. So after MIT, I was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, which has some of the best observatories and best telescopes on the planet. And then from there, I was a researcher at University of Colorado, and now I'm here at University of Washington because those were both really exciting departments to be able to come to. I was very lucky to get a job at University of Washington and came here because there's a lot of overlap with the research I like to do, the telescopes I need for my job, and I have wound up absolutely loving living in Seattle too, so it's been a great fit. But you did get your PhD from University of Hawaii, is that correct? I did, yeah. And is there really a better uh, location for astronomy than Hawaii just because, I mean, it's Hawaii? It was pretty spectacular. It was a wonderful department, another case where I really got a lot of opportunities to use those telescopes to sort of learn how to be a professional astronomer. And yeah, location-wise, it's an exquisite spot on the planet for stars and just a beautiful night sky. And we're extremely lucky to be able to observe from there and do our research from there. So I know a little bit about observational astronomy just from you, really. Is that the main type or are there many different types of astronomy? A lot of us call what I do observational astronomy because we use telescopes and we'll actually go out, get data from a star or a galaxy, and then come back and analyze it. I have colleagues who do theory instead. So instead of getting data, they'll sort of use the physics and math and computer simulations to say, well, here's what we think a star should look like, or here's how we think a galaxy should form. And they'll sort of approach astronomy from that very mathematical, physics-based perspective. I actually like to combine the two if possible. And then there are people who are experts on building telescopes or on running enormous computer models of how literally we think the whole universe could work. So those are all different approaches to answering the same kinds of basic questions about astronomy. You know, where did we come from? How does the universe work? Are we alone? Like these really fundamental but exciting questions that drive what we do. You're a very renowned researcher. And so 
I'm really, really fascinated by what your specific interests are when it comes to astronomy and what your day-to-day life is like. Yeah, so I very literally study the stars. And this is a little stranger than it might sound to people because you'll think, oh, astronomer, of course they study the stars. I have colleagues who are experts on planets or on the moon or on how galaxies work or how the universe began. And my interest is very much on the stars themselves. So sort of how they work and how they evolve. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. Stars are born, they go through different evolutionary stages and then they die. So my specific interest is the sorts of stars that die these big spectacular firework deaths. These are what we call supernovae. And then after the supernova, they leave behind something like a black hole, which is one of the weirdest things that you can imagine in the universe. And I'm really curious about how stars get to that point and sort of their inner workings and what happens to them to make them go from a nice, happy, normal looking star to this black hole that strains the limits of what our brains can understand about how space and time work. And I'll mainly tackle that question by using telescopes to study these stars. I'll try to figure out their chemistry. I'll try to figure out how fast they're rotating, whether they have other stars orbiting around them and things like that. But it all gets back to that basic question of how stars work. And what kind of research are you doing right now that you're super excited about? I pretty recently did some research on Betelgeuse, which is a star that a lot of your listeners might know. It's the big red star in one shoulder of the constellation Orion. And we'll be starting to get a good view of Orion soon because that constellation is visible in the fall and winter sky. Betelgeuse is one of my favorite types of star to study. It's a red supergiant, which means it's very big and cold and really enormous by star standards. If we dropped Betelgeuse where the sun is, in our solar system, it would reach out to almost the orbit of Jupiter. It's huge. So I did a project sort of studying how Betelgeuse's light has changed over time. It dimmed a lot about a year and a half ago. None of us knew why. People were guessing, you know, maybe it's getting dim because it's getting ready to explode and go supernova. Wouldn't that be amazing? And it took a lot of observations and a lot of different people to figure out why it had actually dimmed. It turned out it had just fluffed off some material from its outer layers that sort of turned into dust and blocked our view, just like dust on your windows will block your view. But we didn't know that at first, that was a fun project to work on. And I'm now working on that same sort of idea, what happens when stars puff off material? Does it make it hard for us to see them? But using data from a telescope that actually operates out the back door of a flying plane which has been one of the coolest projects that I've gotten to do. It's a plane that will fly into the stratosphere, open a back door, and let a telescope observe light that you normally couldn't observe from just the ground. And that lets us look at very specific parts of these stars' outer layers of the sort of dust that they puff off to figure out if there's anything more we haven't seen yet about that dust that can help us figure out where it's come from. That's insane. I mean, how many different types of stars are there? There's heaps of different types and astronomers, we love categorizing things so we can break them down into endless categories. But if you look at the stars just in the night sky, especially if you go to somewhere really dark, you'll notice that a lot of them just sort of look like little white points of light, but then some of them might look a little bluish and some of them might look a little reddish. That gives you a sense of what temperature the star is. The really, really hot stars are so hot they glow like white blue and then the cooler ones glow red and that gives you a slight sense of some of the different stellar categories and then we'll categorize them based on how big they are, on how much mass they have, on how old they are and we can get ridiculous with the number of categories. But when we just observe a random star by categorizing it, it tells us a lot about it. We can guess how old it is or whether it's just about to die or whether it's still early in its life. We can tell if its chemistry is weird or if it's puffing off material. So those sorts of categories are really helpful. And that's why we'll go from sort of stargazing where you can just tell, oh, a star might be blue or white or red to using telescopes to really figure out in detail exactly what type of star something is. Well, speaking of telescopes, I know when I look up I know there's a lot of other stuff up there too, like satellites and telescopes. How do you tell the difference between a satellite and a star to the average person like me? 
Oh, yes. Everybody's gotten tricked by these. Especially there are some satellites that are honestly really exciting to catch because you can see them sort of scooting through the night sky. Stars and planets and asteroids don't move that fast. So if you spot something in the sky and then you go, wait a minute, that's moving. You know it's probably not an actual distant celestial object. If it's blinking, it's probably a plane. But if it's just this little dot sliding by slowly, it could be a satellite. It could be the International Space Station or even the Hubble Space Telescope. But it's probably a satellite that we tossed up into orbit around our planet. The satellites do a lot of things, including media and technology. But in your research, do you rely on any satellites in addition to telescopes? We'll mostly rely on telescopes that are satellites, so things like the Hubble Space Telescope. For the most part, satellites, especially as we're launching more and more of them, tend to get in our way because if you're trying to look at a star that's thousands of light years away and then a satellite passes through the front of your image, it's like being photobombed when you're taking a picture. And they can really mess with some of the views that we can get of the universe. So a lot of astronomers right now are trying to figure out how we keep the satellites that we need for life on Earth while not sort of blocking our view of the night sky. What are some other amazing things that you have witnessed that the average person like myself have not seen that are super cool? Well, this is actually something that I think a lot of listeners might have been familiar with, but the total solar eclipse from 2017 was absolutely amazing. And that was my first time ever going to a total eclipse. I have colleagues whose entire job is chasing eclipses and they'll travel all over the planet. They'll bring telescopes with them to observe the sun during an eclipse because it's a really unique chance to observe aspects of the sun. But for me, I just got to go see it for fun. It was dazzling. There's another eclipse coming up in 2024 that is also going to pass right over the United States that I can highly recommend checking out if people have the chance. That had to be one of my favorite things. I think apart from that, just the night sky that you get at a professional observatory, which will be hours from civilization and just out in the middle of absolute nowhere, it's indescribable how many stars you see when it's that dark out. It's just mind-blowing. If anybody ever gets the chance to go somewhere really, really dark and stargaze, absolutely do it. It's an unbelievable view. As a scientist, how do you feel about things like astrology? So I certainly wouldn't recommend people planning their lives or worrying about shaping their personalities around what's going on in the night sky. But I can't hate anything that gets people to look up and gets people curious about the night sky. I think What a lot of astronomers would say is that there are so many changing variables and so many complicated parts of the night sky that imagining what was in the sky when you were born affects your life is going to be a pretty difficult proposition just because it's so much more complicated than we think. At the same time, I had a colleague make a really interesting point to me because professional astronomers, I think, to a person, don't really follow astrology and don't put that as part of their belief system. But he made this point that our lives are affected by the stars more than anybody because somebody might finish a PhD thesis a year early or a year late. If a star dies and produces a supernova, they might want to study that supernova for their work. Anybody who traveled to see the solar eclipse might have driven for days to get to a place where that eclipse was visible. And if it was cloudy that day, you made that trip for nothing. So I think the night sky does affect our lives and that if we love it and are interested in it and curious about it, we'll make decisions based on what we want to see and what we want to understand. But it comes from a scientific curiosity, which I just love. Well, you know, you're a professor. Did you always dream of teaching or is that sort of a necessary part of your research? And do you like it? I'll confess, I didn't always dream of teaching. I wanted to be a researcher and then learned you sort of, quote, have to teach. And of course, now I love it. Now that I've gotten the chance to do it, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. And I love teaching 
our astronomy majors at the University of Washington. They're such an awesome and enthusiastic group. And I love giving sort of presentations to the public too and getting people excited about and curious about astronomy. I think it's a really important job of people in any scientific field. And I think especially a field like astronomy, which is a little sort of whimsical and far reaching. I think it's really our job to explain to people what we do, why we do what we do, why it's worthy of taxpayer support, why it's worthy of our curiosity. And I think giving that to people is one of the most important parts of my job. And it's also really fun. People are so naturally curious and enthusiastic about how the night sky works. And I love talking to people about it, answering questions about it, preparing students to study it. It's a great part of the job. Kind of coming back a little bit to your book, The Last Stargazer is basically your thesis is really there's not that many people and getting into astronomy and how do we create more of a buzz to get people involved in astronomy? Does things like SpaceX help? Does recruiting more women or people of color into astronomy, does that help? And how do we do that? I So the title of the book, The Last Stargazers, it's something a lot of people have asked me about going, well, that sounds depressing. Are there really no people interested in stargazing? And it's exactly the opposite. There's plenty of people who are fascinated by the night sky. There's so many young people who would love to make this a career and are incredibly enthused about the science. So the title is, for one, it's a little bit of a challenge. So like plenty of people still stargaze every day, either it's for their job or just for the pleasure of it. And I want us to recognize and use that kind of enthusiasm. One thing the book looks at a lot and another aspect of this title is how technology is changing our jobs. The role that astronomers play in our work is really different now than it was 50 or 100 years ago. We used to sit at a telescope all night. In some cases, we'd literally be attached to the telescope, sort of steering it to one star and then another star. Now, astronomers observe from a different room in the observatory, or we run a telescope from our couches and our laptops. We have robotic telescopes. And it means that astronomers aren't really present at the telescope anymore. It's an amazing advance for the science because in a lot of ways this helps us observe more efficiently. But I wrote the book in part to preserve the stories of what it was like when we sort of were very hands-on at the telescope. And as we continue to see all the tech advancements, we wanna keep in mind that we still want people in astronomy. We still have a really good role to play in discovery. Sort of human curiosity is what propels the work that we do. So I don't want us to be the last stargazers because astronomy gets more automated. I want us to still keep curious people and enthusiastic scientists deeply involved in the work that we do. What I kind of appreciate about the book is that it talks about science in less academic terms, which makes it more accessible to the masses, I think. Was that a deliberate choice? Yeah, very much so. There are wonderful, lots of wonderful scientific books about astronomy where you can learn about how the universe is going to end or like what are people's most common questions about the universe. And they're great and they're very science focused. And I found that a lot of people really get hooked on these sort of people stories of astronomy. And you think about some of the recent movies that have really resonated with people like Hidden Figures, which is talking about the mathematical challenges of sending rockets to space. But it's not a movie about math. It's a movie about the women who made that math happen. And sort of getting the personal stories behind the science is a really good way to connect with people. I especially hope that it's the sort of book someone will pick up even thinking, oh, you know, I don't normally read science books. I'm not a math person, but I'm a little curious about this because what they'll see are the people doing the work and why we do the work we do. To explain the people, you have to know a little bit about the science. You have to know why we put telescopes out in the middle of nowhere where it's dark, or you have to know why when a star goes supernova, people fly into a panic to observe it as quickly as possible. So the science kind of sneaks in and you'll find almost by accident that you've learned some of the science, but it's driven by understanding the human experiences of the field. Where can you get the book? 
anywhere books are sold now. So if you go to thelaststargazers.com, that's the website that I keep up for the book and you can find links to, for example, IndieBound, where you can order from local bookstores. A favorite bookstore of mine here in Seattle is Ada's Technical Books, which is a women in STEM themed bookstore, which is just awesome. And I wrote chunks of the book in their cafe, or you can buy it from really whatever bookseller you prefer. There's also an audiobook edition if people are interested. Did you narrate? A wonderful narrator named Janet Metzger did the narration. I think she and I chatted briefly to sort of work out pronunciations because there's some funky names in the book. But yeah, there's an audiobook edition available as well. So in writing the book, and you know, obviously we were HMLG as your lawyers, I like to sprinkle a little bit of legal stuff into all the Lawyer Who Rocks podcasts. But talk about the publication journey a bit. So I had not ever worked in the sort of trade book or popular publishing regime. I'd written academic books and I'd published scientific papers, but moving into a publishing realm like this, where suddenly you're talking about intellectual property and liability and scary legal words that I did not know when I started on this process. This is why I knew I needed to work with HMLG. And it was interesting to come talk to you as people who work with sort of entertainment and the arts, because I think science and the arts have a lot more in common than most people think. There's a lot of creativity involved in these jobs. This is sort of, it's a labor of love. You go into it because there's a certain amount of romance and passion, and there's a disconnect from sort of more traditional jobs. It's not, you may not be somebody who's super into business or understanding the details of how this works, which meant that you have to get into it really quickly when you want to engage with the business side of things. So I started out by writing a book proposal and then the book proposal got sold to a publisher, Sourcebooks, who has been wonderful. And we worked out the contract for the book with Sourcebooks and that and sort of the agent and overseas contracts is where it was so wonderful to have advice on how to do this in a way that sort of stuck with the norms of the publishing field while also letting, you know, the author have the creativity that I needed. That was an invaluable part of the process, but it was a brand new process to me. So I sort of got a trial by fire introduction to how book publishing worked by virtue of writing this book. It's kind of an interesting, it's a whole other ball of wax, isn't it? The whole media and technology side. I didn't even know what to ask when I first came in. So it was wonderful to be able to sit down with somebody and ask the question that my students tend to ask of, I just don't get it. Can you tell me what's going on? What should I even be asking you? And even understanding things like how to negotiate sort of liability or indemnity and things like like the sorts of things that hopefully if everything goes well, shouldn't come up. But this was something that I got explained to me. Contracts aren't for when everything goes well. (laughs) They're for when something goes wrong. And having that sort of explanation and security meant that I could just focus on the book and the science, which was wonderful. You mentioned that you had ordinarily have been writing research papers and research books. Are you writing anything now? I have some students finishing up some really awesome papers, looking at, again, things like how stars sort of puff off mass at the ends of their lives and get ready to die. I'm starting off writing this paper on how red supergiants work and studying them from this telescope plane, which again, it's one of my favorite stories in the book using a facility like that. And I'm writing lots of grants, which is where a lot of scientists writing tends to be focused because we need funding support for our research. As few astronomers as there are, there's even less money. So we have to really make a good case for why our research is worth money from NASA or the National Science Foundation to support. So we all get very good at writing grants and writing explanations for why we need to do the science that we do. So that's where a lot of my energy is going right now. Do you find that when the public is generally more invested in, you know, space and astronomy, does that help with grants and does that help with getting people more interested in funding research? I hope it gets people more interested and I hope that people understand that we get such a tiny fraction of the taxpayer penny right now goes to understanding the entire universe and just a little bit more would go such a long way. It's also not necessarily just individuals' decisions. Our budgets get set for NASA or the National Science Foundation through Congress, through a lot of sort of legislative processes. So. If you're excited about SpaceX launches and you're excited about launching new telescopes and landing on Mars, 
I keep that in mind in, when it comes to supporting the people who are going to represent your interests and finding people who are supportive of science and enthusiastic about science and willing to fund it because that does eventually trickle down to those of us who are doing the research. And like I said, even tiny bits more make such a huge difference. Well, what is next on the horizon for Emily? Some of the grants that I'm writing are focused on studying a new type of star that my colleagues and I discovered about, I think, seven or eight years ago. And they're these very weird stars. The best way to understand them is it's like a Russian nesting doll star. There's one star hidden inside another. We don't know a lot about how well these stars work because the one star is hidden. It makes it very difficult to tell the difference between normal stars and stars like this. And these stars are known as Thorn Zhitkov objects. They're named after two astronomers who discovered them. And I'm hoping that we'll get to learn a lot more about how you make a star like that, where one star is just hidden inside another, how long they live, what they might make when they die. Does a star like this maybe make a black hole or something else we don't know about? So I'm working on writing grants that'll give me the funding and resources to study stars like that. They sound really far-fetched, and it's a very fair question to ask, you know, why should we spend money on something like that? But a thing I love about astronomy and about physics is that you never really know where that research is going to lead. These stars get their energy from very hard to understand places. They produce elements in a way that we don't understand and understanding more about energy or how the elements in our universe get made. You don't know what sort of exciting applications that might have years from now. Plus it's just really cool. So that's sort of where I'm at right now is sort of kicking off more research on that topic. That's also a project that I write about in the book because it's one of the coolest discoveries I've ever gotten to make. Well, it's so obvious from when we've met, it's like you're such an intellectual powerhouse. And I love how enthusiastic you are about what you do and the discoveries you're making and the research you're doing. Always such a joy to listen to you and talk to you. I think all of this makes you such a badass. And I would love to know what you think makes you a badass. I think the same answer would apply to me or a lot of my colleagues. Like you get to have a lot of really surprising adventures as an astronomer. And as a kid, I think I had a very average amount of interest in adventure. I wasn't, you know, the kid diving down the slide head first. I sort of thought it would be neat to study space and I didn't realize that I'd get to sort of roam around my own planet as a result. And it has been really fun to get to travel to, you know, the remote corners of the deserts of Chile or to the tops of some of the most remote mountains on the planet or fly on a telescope plane. I have colleagues who have talked about, you know, being at observatories when a bear wanders into the building, which is a true story and have been at observatories when volcanoes have erupted. And I didn't think that astronomy would have this sort of madcap Indiana Jones adventure feel. I didn't think that I would have a job like this. And I especially didn't think that I would have this much fun with it. So that's been a pretty badass part of this job. Well, I so appreciate you taking a few minutes today to talk to me on the podcast. Like I said, it's just a joy to always hear about what you're doing and all the cool adventures you get to have. I'm jealous. But thank you so much for being on The Lawyer Who Rocks today. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to The Lawyer Who Rocks. If you've enjoyed it and want to hear more from Business Badasses, make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. While you're at it, please give us a review. It really helps us grow the show. The Lawyer Who Rocks is produced and edited by Sean Fox and HMLG. A big thank you to Aaron Jones for our theme music, to Jeff Gilbert at Hairball Media for our graphics, and a huge thanks to my entire team at HMLG. If you need a lawyer who rocks, find us at hmlglaw.com. On the next episode... That is the biggest thing. I've seen so many people hit publish. They have no followers, they have no newsletter, and they have no lists. You can't sell a book to people that don't know you. This podcast has been brought to you by HMLG. If you need lawyers who rock, visit us on our website at hmlglaw.com and be sure to follow us on social media platforms at hmlglaw. You can also follow me on Instagram at the lawyer who rocks. Doesn't happen often, but every so often, I, it happens mostly to me. So. <laughs>